All right. Everybody good? If you got your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Let me say this as we're just getting into our teaching time this morning. Some cool things happen in first service. And so I'm very excited about what God has for you here today. Let's pray. Well, God, um, we just got done singing about everything. And Father, that is a word that summarizes what you want of us. Lord, it's easy to give you some. It's easy to give you a little bit. But Lord, there there just is it's hard to just decide that that we're all in. And and so God, today you have laid this to be spoken clearly to your people. And so, God, I, I just want to get out of the way. But, Lord, for some people today, th- this is really a big deal. This, this is an important day for their next step in their faith. And, and, Lord, no one more than you wants that to happen. So, Father, minimize the distractions. Help us to see Jesus clearly today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're engaged in a dialogue uh, this year about loving God and loving people. The cool thing is on Tuesday, we get to actually put that into practice. We're going to be at the 4-H building from 11 to 2, serving lunch to our city and county workers. Many of you got postcards in the mail about bringing desserts. And I I would encourage you, if you're not doing anything, join us. More hands on deck, the the better over at the 4-H building. I'm excited about that. But we're talking about this thing called following Jesus. And we learn that following Jesus always leads to a next step. And the two questions that we want to tackle today are real simple. And again, listen, I, I want you to listen today. Because for some of you, this is right where you're at right now. And you're just kind of wondering, what is the next step? You've been in church. Okay, you've accomplished, you've mastered that task. But... Today, for some of you, is just it's the beginning of a new life. So the two questions we want to ask today that we're going to wrestle with, and again, if you're old enough to be in here, you're going to wrestle with them. What is it going to cost me to follow Jesus? That eventually there's going to come a point where I, I prayed the prayer, I followed the Lord in baptism, I'm doing a Christian thing, but there's going to come a point if you're really serious and legitimately interested in following Jesus, there's going to come this this defining moment in your life, and you'll know it when it arrives, where you're going to just have to make a choice, and that choice is going to cost you something. And so today, we want to, I want to give you what it's going to cost you. And the second question that we want to answer is, okay, if it costs me anything, and if the cost is too much, what would be the compelling reason why I should? So those are the two questions that we want to wrestle with today. Now, we're Americans, right? We're good, old-fashioned, red-blooded Americans. And Americans don't pay full price for anything, right? Do we? Right? We're Costco. We're Sam's Club. We're Walmart. We're Amazon. I buy everything on Amazon, right? Okay? So we don't pay full price. We, we got that consumer mindset that I want the maximum benefit. I want the nicest product for, for the least amount of costs. And you're no different than my wife. My wife is that way, and I appreciate that about her. My wife takes mission trips to New York uh, quite frequently. And what I love about Amy is Amy always thinks of her husband and kids before herself. Anybody married to someone like that? She does. She'll have money and she'll spend it on her kids and her husband for, before she'll spend it on herself. So she's on this mission trip in New York, and she knows I like fine handcrafted timepieces, aka watches, all right? And in my hand, I hold a Tag Heuer watch. Anybody ever heard of a Tag Heuer watch? Okay, only the finest craftsmen know what a time a tag hoyer watches. All right. So I so so Amy comes home and she's got all these gifts and she's like, oh Kevin, you you're gonna love this. I'm like, what? You know, I'm like, Michael and David, get back, you get your prize later. What's mine, right? Okay. And she pulls out a tag. 
wife of the year. What? Don't, Mike? I, I looked up this model at Jared's Jewelers, right? Some of you went there, right? This retails for $1,195 at Jared. My wife loves me more than you, doesn't she? All right, but anyway. But my wife is an American who always gets a deal. We don't pay full price for nothing. So in a back alley with a guy named Demetrius, all right, out of a suitcase, she bought this Tag Hoyer watch. How much was it, baby? Fifteen dollars, all right. It was thirty, and she talked him down. All right, okay. I mean, hey, I married up. I married up, right? So she comes home with this Tag Hoyer watch, and I'm wearing it. But there was a problem. It was 4.30 all the time, all right? Every time, I mean, I went, it's 4.30, it's 4.30, it's 4.30. I came to the realization, it's not a tag for your watch. It's what? It's what? It's a knockoff, it's, it's fake. And you know that, right? And I'm sure my wife knew this. She did. All right. <laughs> she just wasn't so sure I would get it, right? Hey, I'll get hey, look at this watch, all right. And and here's how we know it's a fake. Because it looks like a tag hoyer. It feels like a tag hoyer. It actually is heavy. It weighs like a tag hoyer, but you know it's fake because of how much it costs. See that consumer mentality unfortunately has shifted into the Americans' mindset in their faith. They want the maximum benefit with the least amount of cost. I want Jesus to heal me. I want Jesus to bless me. I want Jesus to help my kids turn out well. I want Jesus to make my family happy. I want Jesus to meet all of our needs. But I want it with as little cost as possible personally. Now, unfortunately, churches have realized this consumer mindset of the American Christian, and some churches have become Costco Jesus outlet sellers, where we're going to bless you. We want you to go to heaven. We want to provide phenomenal programs. We want you to feel blessed. We want you to have your blessing cup full. We want you to know the WWJD karma, but we're not going to request anything of you. We're not actually going to expect members to show up in church. We're not going to require anything of you. And we're certainly, we're certainly not, because, you know, it's Costco Church. We're not going to tell you you're wrong. And unfortunately, a lot of churches have done this to cater to the consumer mindset of the American Christian. And here's what's happened. First Timothy 3 describes it perfectly, that we have produced a generation of Christians who have the appearance, they look like it, they talk like it, they act like it, but they're not the real thing. Do you know why? Because their faith costs them nothing. And here's the great news. Not all churches are like that and not all Christians are like that. So I want to ask you a question today. Are you a follower? And as you answer this question today, don't, don't start describing to me attributes that you would see on a phony watch. What you do. What you look like. Here in church. Because you're going to measure whether you're a follower or not by how much it costs you. Remember at the beginning of the year when we told you that our endeavor this year is to make you as uncomfortable as possible. Anybody remember that? Okay, and you came back. It's your fault. All right. But not mine. I told you. Today, um, we're going to up the ante a little bit on, on the uncomfortableness. And all of us, all of us are in this boat. So if you got your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. So two questions we're going to answer today. What's it going to cost me? And if it's going to cost me anything, what would be the compelling reason to pay the price? So here we go. Mark chapter 8, Jesus has already gathered his disciples He's been doing his Jesus thing. He's been feeding people. He's been healing people. He's been teaching. And he's, there's quite a buzz has been created in the Galilean area. And he has his disciples following him. And he's got just these masses that are very interested. I mean, actually, following Jesus has its benefits, doesn't it? 
He's healing people. He's feeding people. And so he's got these, this massive crowd. And so it's in the midst of when Jesus is at the highest point of his popularity that Jesus has this discussion with Peter. And here's what he says in Mark chapter 8. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, hey, who, who do people say that I am? Well, Peter answers, some believe that you're John the Baptist. At this point, John the Baptist has already been beheaded. So they think this is the resurrected John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, it's the Old Testament prophet. Some think you're a, an amazing teacher, an amazing rabbi, a prophet. And Jesus says, you know, that's all well and good, but I have a question for you. Who do you think I am? Peter knocks it out of the ballpark, doesn't he? Look what he says. You're the Christ. You're God. You're, you're, you're God in the flesh. So at this point, Peter knows who he is. Peter believes the right thing. But it's interesting that Jesus says then and strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So at this point, at the highest peak of Jesus' popularity, with, pe with Peter fully understanding who he is, Jesus then <laughs> kind of tells him, here's what's coming. And in telling him, here's what's coming, here's what he's asking Peter. Are you really still committed to following me? Here's what he says. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. He would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. In other words, there's this un uncomfortable awkwardness in this room because basically what Jesus is saying is, Peter, all of this that you've enjoyed, that by being affiliated with me as I have grown in popularity, Peter has grown in popularity. As Jesus has been... Uh, highly viewed in public life, so is Peter by virtue of the relationship. But Jesus says, hey, Peter, I want to let you know it's, it's basically downhill from here, and here's what's going to happen. I, I'm going to teach, and I'm going to so antagonize and, and upset the religious elite that they're literally going to want me killed. And then Peter, <laughs> Peter, all right, Peter, pulls him aside, and I can imagine he puts his arm around Jesus and says, you know, Son of God, let's go talk, all right? And pulls him over and basically says, listen, no way. Jesus, stop going negative on me. Jesus, do you understand that we followed you? We didn't know exactly what this was going to be. Uh, I left my family, by the way, family business. Remember that fishing thing? I left that for you. And, and why would you do this? Why would you stop this tremendous momentum? Jesus, we're having impact. We're reaching sinners. We're doing amazing things. What does Jesus say to Peter? He says, Peter, get behind me. Next word, say it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now think about the context. We read this, but we miss it a lot. Do you understand what has Peter left to follow Jesus? He has left his family. He has left his family business. And, and because I question you, Jesus, because I tell you this isn't good, you, you go all Satan on me, right? Call me Satan, really? Why would Jesus respond so... I mean, Jesus didn't hold back. And it, it, I, I think it's the Peter mindset that most American Christians have. Let me ask you something. Was Peter really concerned about what happened to Jesus or what would happen to himself? Well, if you read the Bible, you know. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter was an intelligent fisherman to recognize this enough, that if they would kill Jesus, and I'm one of Jesus' followers, what will they do to me? Okay, this side must be more intelligent than this side. Let me come over here, all right? That, I'm, I'm teasing, all right? They'd kill me. And so Peter says, no, 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 no. I don't want this to happen. And, 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 and Jesus comes right back at him and says, okay, now I see who you really are. You're following me for all you can get out of me. You know what? You're, you're this consumer-minded follower that you're willing to, to associate and be connected with me as long as life is good and easy for you. And now that I'm warning you that this is going to happen to me, you, you could care less what happens to me. The only reason you're so emotional and passionate right now is because you see what's going to happen to you because you're connected with me. 
So Jesus recognizes that it's not Peter. He's not the only one that struggles with this. Everyone else does. So he gets to make Peter a nice little public example. So Mark chapter 8, he says this in verse 34. He calls everyone over. Hey, everyone, come over. Come over with me and say, I mean, Peter, all right? I want you to hear what I got to say. And he says to them, if anyone would come after me. See, Peter spoke what everybody thinks. Jesus What's it going to cost me? You think it down here, teens. You know this. You go to school every day. You got to make a choice, don't you? Every day. Am I going to follow Jesus or not? Going to church is easy. Because your parents make you, right? No, all right. Going to church is easy. But there comes a point where you have got to decide. Am I really going to follow Jesus? So Jesus says, let me just put the price tag out. Let me just lay it out for you. Christian, disciple. If you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And then he he doesn't stop. He just kind of takes the knife and twists a little bit. He says, for whosoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Let me ask you a question. There's going to come a moment. There's going to come an experience. There's going to come a time where, where what you want badly. And what Jesus wants for you are going to just intersect. And those defining moments, and you know what they are, they'll happen. It is what you decide in that moment that really tells whose you are. It's going to happen in your relationships. It's going to happen in your opportunities. It's going to happen in your decisions. But but there's just too many, too many Christians who, who want the benefit, the consumer-minded, the Costco Christian. I want all my blessings. I want, I want to feel Jesus. I want the love. I want the peace. But following you to that? No thanks. The Bible says it's after this conversation that the many dwindled dramatically. Jesus got unfriended a lot after this conversation. Jesus what? No, I'm not one of them. And here's the point. And, and follow me, because this is where, this is where it's going to get quieter, all right? It's already quiet. Quiet has been a long time, all right? It's going to get more quiet. Salvation costs you nothing. Hey, anybody, look at me, anybody can come up here and recognize you're messed up. And by the way, it's not hard to recognize you're messed up. Let's be honest. We all know that. And, and God knew that, and so He sent His Son Jesus to die for your sin, and by simply inviting Jesus to come into your life, it absolutely costs you nothing. Nothing. You, can, you say it can't be that simple. It is that simple. It's not how good you are. It's not how bad you are. All you have to do to be connected with God is to recognize I messed up, God loves me. He sent His Son, Jesus. I invite you to come into my life. That, my friend, costs you absolutely nothing. 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 But it costs Jesus Christ His life. And for 33 years, being made fun of and mocked and humiliated for you. And to enter into that relationship absolutely costs you nothing. Following Jesus. You know what it costs you? It costs you saying no to you and yes to Jesus. And that is a decision that you make not one time up here. That is what you decide every single day of your life. And somehow, some way, we've gotten so comfortable that because I prayed that prayer and I, I invited Jesus in my life that costs me nothing, that now I'm done. Now I can just go back to the old life. Now I can just kind of live life knowing that because I prayed a prayer and invited Jesus to come into my life, I'm going to heaven. This this other stuff, this following stuff, no thank you. And that is most Christians. Now here's the cool thing. Peter did not get this till the end. To the very end, because remember when Jesus was arrested and previously he said, no, 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 no. These jerks may not go with you, but I'll die for you. I'll do anything. And a middle school girl says, hey, aren't you one of them Jesus boys? No, blankety blank. All right, three times. 
He denied him. Peter didn't get this till the very end. So if you struggle with this, this following thing, welcome to the club. We all do. All of us gravitate toward easy. All of us gravitate toward saying yes to us. But Jesus isn't done. It's like, man, just stop. Here's what he says. Jesus says this, for what does it profit a man? In other words, there's the cost. The cost of you following Jesus is on a consistent basis, you saying no to you and yes to Jesus. And for me, man, I, there's defining moments in my life. When I was 15 years old, I, I came to Christ when I was 13. And boy, there was this cute girl at Stony Brook Junior High School. Monica, all right? And, and I sat by Monica in Algebra 1. And Monica, not only was she cute, girl was smart, all right? She could do algebra, all right? But Monica wasn't a Christian. And I was involved in a youth group, really tight-knit. And I, when I'd sit by Monica, you'd hear, you got that love and feeling, you know, all that, just all the, you know, and I thought, man, my, I'm going to invite Monica to church. Monica, will you come to church with me? No. Why not? I don't believe in God. Man, she's cute and smart, and nice, and doesn't stink, you know, and combs her hair and all that, and her glasses aren't like, but anyways, I, anyway, and so I remember talking with my youth minister, Tom Townsend, and for me, this was one of those moments where what I wanted conflicted with what God said. And I remember I had to tell my heart, no. And it hurt. My God, can I can I mix business with pleasure? You know, can I like date and winter to Jesus? I mean, that's that's like the perfect thing. Little did I know God had somebody awesome. Awesome Christian I get to marry. For some of you it's your finances, right? You get saved and you come in to this relationship with Jesus and Jesus wants to invade your, your money and you're like, God, I don't see how this is going to work. And Jesus says, hey, for some of you, it's an opportunity where you, you have to say no because you know that weekend with the guys is ju it's just not going to help. I, and you know it's not good for you to go. And here's the big deal. If it costs me this much, why would I want to pay this? Because it, it's hard and it hurts to say no to yourself. And Jesus says this. He says, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? For what can a person give in return for their soul? Look at me. Everybody look up here. Here's the deal. Here's what God knows about you. You value your soul. You know how I know you value your soul? You wouldn't be here at 1045 in church if you didn't value your soul. And Jesus says this, in the end, that you would give anything, you would surrender any relationship to get your soul back. And for some, that reality is not going to become obvious to them until after they die. And the tragedy of that is, is that it's too late. Here's what I know you would give anything for your soul. I, would, I wish during the week you could come and sit in my office and talk to individuals that are older, that have gone through life, and their soul is messed up. Because that intersection that arrived in their life where they had an opportunity to say no to, Jesus, no to themselves and yes to Jesus, they said yes to themselves and no to Jesus, and it has impacted every relationship in their life. And their soul is not right. And, and the, reason, the reason they're there is because what do I need to get my soul right? But the problem is in the heat of the moment when we're following, it just doesn't seem like it's worth it. But in the end, you would do anything to get your soul back. You would give any opportunity up. That girl that didn't know Jesus, you know what? She's not worth it in me distancing myself from God. That, 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 that lust that I have in my heart and that computer that's my master and not Jesus and that website I go to every day is not worth it, and I know it, and my soul is messed up. And, and there's so many Christians that find themselves years later, and they recognize and, and, and the painful reality that in the end, I'd give anything for my soul. You know how I know this? 
Some of you did things as teenagers and it's still stuck with you. And you're 50, 60, 70 years old. Because there are things about your soul that medicine can't take away. There are things about your soul that, that you can't do things to make it feel good. It is only your creator, Jesus. And for some of you, look at me. You're in church, but you've sold your soul out to a hobby, to a habit, to a person, to an occupation. And, and look at me. Your soul's not right. And the problem is this following thing. So, Jesus doesn't stop there. You're like, please. Here's what he says. Verse 38, For whosoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of his Father and holy angels. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that in, in your life that you're this consumer, convenient Christian person and there comes an opportunity for you to align your life with Christ and because of the pressure of our culture, you don't do that, that Jesus is going to disown you? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? I don't believe that. But I think it would do us well to think that we need to stop taking our faith so casually. But you know what, if if you, for instance, I'm married and I have a wedding ring. I'm married to that beautiful woman right there, June 7th, 1991. I, I said, yes, I committed my life to her and I wear this wedding ring. It's an indication of a commitment that I made to her. You get on my Facebook page, there's pictures of me and Amy everywhere. You know what, because I have a relationship with her, I want everyone to know. And yet for for many, that your relationship with Jesus is, the extent of it is very limited based upon how convenient and advantageous it is for you. And Jesus literally says this in the book of Revelation, and again, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it's actually true. That's, that kind of consumer-minded Christian it makes literally Jesus want to throw up. And the sad reality of it is, it is this consumer mindset that occupies a majority of our church in America today. Look at me. No wonder, no wonder our kids, no thanks. And, and here's the thing. All of us gravitate toward being phony, don't we? You did, you did this. Anybody ever fight on the way to church? I never have. Anybody else ever fight on the way to church? Okay. And isn't it amazing when you hit the threshold of the church door, how you can like flip the switch you're like, you're a jerk. Oh, you shut up. You fat. Blah, blah, blah. You know, hey, how are you? Oh, we love Jesus and we're happy and we're doing good. And we had our devotions and we prayed eight hours before we got here. Just look at him and go, tag Hoyer, right? Tag Hoyer. See, and that's the thing. It's funny when you come to church and everybody tries to fake it. And we all know we're faking it. So why not we just be real? So... I began wrestling with this about two weeks ago. I tried to work a couple weeks ahead. And I was sitting in my office and it was a, a quiet day. And I began to ask this question, am I a follower of Jesus? And here's the cool thing. I get paid to be holy. Did you know that? I actually get paid to behave. All right. I get paid to, and I still struggle with it. All right. Okay. That's the reality. And so, I mean, you're a preacher. So preachers are automatic. Let me ask you something. Are all, just because I'm a preacher, does that make me a true follower of Jesus? Yes or no? No, as a matter of fact, admittedly, it is the easiest place to fake it. So I started asking myself this question. And again, I'm not the only one that struggles with this. Jerry does. And let me tell you, Jason definitely does. Okay, but anyways, no. Where, where's he at? There. Uh, hey, bud, I love you. And hugs. Hey, love God, love people, right? That's what we do. We'll sit there and talk about people, and they'll say, love God, love people. But anyways, no. We're, we're all in the struggle bus when it comes to following Jesus. We are. But here's the question. What are you going to do about it? So I begin to ask myself this question. Do people really know? That I'm, I'm not just, uh, throw the pastor thing out. Am I a follower of Jesus?
And the cost is not how good of a sermon you can preach on Sunday. That's easy. It's on a regular basis, do I say no to me and yes to Jesus? And do you know that that private decision shows up when your kids see you? You can't hide that. Do you know that shows up when your, your spouse sees you at your worst? So I, I, I had to pin. I, you ever had those times where God just is really talking to you and you have to write it down? I had to write it down. So in, in, the, in privacy of my office, I wrote this down as I was wrestling. And by the way, I felt convicted when I really stopped the busyness of being a Christian and looked in my heart and said, are you really a follower? I honestly didn't like what I saw. So I had to write this. I've decided to follow Jesus. This means that when I want for me, this means what I want for me and what Jesus wants for me collide, I will say no to me and yes to Jesus. Even if saying yes to Jesus costs me relationships, opportunities, and favor, I've decided that my soul, in the end, is more valuable than anyone anything, and any opportunity. In the end, I recognize I would trade anything to get my soul back. I haven't mastered this following Jesus thing. Frankly, I struggle with it every day of my life. As I identify myself as a follower of Christ, it doesn't make me better than you. In fact, it makes me responsible to you. To love you as God has loved me in my struggle in following. To love you graciously patiently, and generously. I am a follower of Christ. And here's what I had to do. And again, you might think, ah, Kevin, what? I had to put this on my Facebook. Facebook does have a few good things about it. All right? Okay. Because I wanted everyone to know that's remotely attached with me that more than being a pastor, more than being, more than being able to tell phenomenally funny good jokes, sarcastic laugh, all right, that I really am. I really, let me say this, I really want to be a follower of Jesus. And the reason I did that is because I, I, as I read this passage, here's a truth that I discovered and I had to write this down, and it helped me this week. It, I took a next step this week. If you don't publicly declare that your relationship with Christ is so compelling that I privately decide to say no to me and yes to Jesus, our culture will suffocate and squeeze all of the follow Jesus right out of you. Let me repeat that. If you don't publicly declare that your relationship with Jesus is so important that I have to, it's not an option for me as a follower, I have to say no to me and yes to Jesus. If I don't publicly state that, and everyone in my circle know that, our culture will suffocate and squeeze all of the follow of Jesus right out of you. It does. Do you know why? I, I've sat at the altar at, with kids at, at summer camp, and they were as sincere as sincere could be. And they committed their lives to follow Jesus. And something along the way, the cost got pretty expensive. And you know what? They wanted to. I really believe that with all of my heart they wanted to. But somehow, some way, our culture sucked and squeezed and suffocated all of the follow of Jesus right out of them. I've sat in my office with adults. And man, just God woke them up and said, I, I need to change. And man, they were committed to following Jesus. And they meant it. I believe they meant it with all their heart. But something happened along the way where the cost just got so expensive. They said, oh. And maybe it was just one or two of those times where they said yes to themselves and no to Jesus. And what happened is our culture is, is just like locust. It just, when, when our culture catches that, it will literally suffocate and squeeze all of the follow of Jesus right out of you. And so what we've done is we've created an atmosphere in our churches that that's okay. But Jesus says it is. So, here's my question. Are you a follower? And again, don't, don't go to the church thing. Don't go to the, don't go to the phony stuff. Being in church is not phony. Come back next week. All right, it's good. But following Jesus is a whole lot more than coming up here and praying a prayer and saying, I want Jesus to come into my life. That costs you nothing. 
and it's available. And if you haven't done that, that is the first step. And don't wait. But following Jesus is publicly declaring that my relationship with Jesus matters so much to me that I can't just confine it to a building. I can't confine it to a day. I can't confine it to a place. Literally, this following Jesus thing, every day I have to privately decide I'm going to say no to me and yes to Jesus. Can I ask you a question, mom or dad? Have your children ever seen you declare your allegiance to God publicly? And you say, well, Kevin, I bring them to church. That's great. I'm glad you do that. Kevin, we even do a family faith talk at D6. That's great. Have, have your children, now maybe when you were younger, you publicly declared your faith, but have your children ever seen you publicly stand up and say, I'm a follower of Jesus? Do you know our kids need to see that? They do. We're, our kids do everything like us. Let me ask you something. Grandparents, have your grandchildren ever seen you publicly declare your faith? You say, well, I, nana, boo-boo, pop-pop, whatever they call you. All right, okay. You know, they, they know you're a Christian and they know you're good and they know you go to church. But have they ever seen you publicly declare your faith? Hey, let me ask you guys over here. You go to school, right? Okay, I guess you can get arrested for not going to school when you should be in school somewhere, right? Okay. Do, do the people that you hang with know that beyond going to a church that you're a follower of Jesus? Do they? I mean, if they said at your lunch table, would they say, God's important to him? Here's a question. And that, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because you know, if I say that, there's a cost, isn't there? So here's what I want to do today. I want to give you the opportunity. And again, this isn't for everybody. And, and by not coming up here does not mean you're a follower. That's not what I'm saying. But for some of you, to get you headed in the right direction or to reaffirm in your midst of your struggle that you are headed in the right direction, that you're a follower, you need to publicly declare it. And if you got your cell phone, bring it with you when you come up. If you're here today and you, you, you haven't realized or recognized, but you have lived in this consumer Christian mindset where give me God, but God Anything from me, I don't have time, I'm too busy. God, I don't have the money. God, I'm, that's a little bit out of my comfort zone. Jesus says, you're never, ever going to find peace. You're never going to find all the full blessing until you follow me. So here's what we're going to do. And again, it's not for everybody, but for some of you it is. It's time to publicly declare your faith. Well, well my family knows, Dad, when is, have your kids ever seen you stand up and say, I am a follower of Jesus? Kids, do, do your peers know? I know you go to Rock Prairie. But bigger than that, are you a follower of Jesus? So Artie's playing, and, um, and again, older generations. For some of you, I mean, life is hard. Man, losing a, a sister... And, but it's time to declare your, your allegiance to God. So if, if God has spoken to you, come on up right now. Lights up, please. I want everybody to see it. Because God said this, that whosoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my father. With his. If you Look at me. If you can't stand up and say you're a follower of Jesus in church, you ain't going to do it out there. Our culture is going to squeeze and suck the living daylights out of you. You won't follow. So if, if this is for you, again, if you not coming does not make you a follower. Okay, but come on up. Come on up, Miss Martha. Who's willing to publicly declare, I am a follower of Jesus? And if you got your cell phones, bring it with you. This is for men, women, and children. Everybody is allowed to come if you want. If I can have some folks on the end, if you can actually go up on the stage, that would be kind of cool. We want to have room. Hey, do this. Don't come up here if you're not willing to actually do the dirty work, all right? It's a tough decision to make. 
Okay, do this. If your parents here and your kids are here, get with them somehow, some way. Sorry. Well, I've got poor faith. I didn't think it'd be nearly this many people, so I didn't plan. So if you're really not serious, go back to your chair. No. <laughs> Here's what I want you to do. How many of you have your cell phone? Anybody got your cell phone? Okay, if you have a cell phone, if you... Here's what I want you to do. Get on your... How many of you have Facebook? Get on your Facebook right now. For those of you that don't have Facebook, don't get on it. You won't miss it. You're not missing anything. Everybody get on your Facebook. Right now. And here's what I want you to put on your status. Everybody got it? Real simple. I am a follower of Jesus. Post. Anybody here got Twitter? Okay. The thing is, I have Twitter. I'm so cool I have Twitter, and I still don't know how it works, all right? Isn't that awesome? So if you have Twitter, here we go. I am a follower of... I actually had to help Tom spell Jesus this morning, Tom List. He was taking all kinds of time. I said, Tom, it's J-E. How many of you have a phone that has contacts in it? Okay, a list of all your phone numbers. Here's what you're going to do today. Every person that you have a contact with, take the time today and text them a mass message. I want you to know I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now here's the deal. If, if this is the case, if this is the case with, with this group, and, and you too, you too does not make you an unfollower. Our, our church should be a lot bigger. You know that, right? There are people in your neighborhood that if you're a follower, this week is the week you get to talk to them. You know what? Uh, the, the people that, that need Jesus, God's put you in their neighborhood to reach them. This is pretty awesome. Can I just look around and take it in for a second? This is pretty cool. So, so I want to make sure you understood. I didn't say I'm paying you 10 bucks to come up front today. <laughs> that by being standing up today, you're declaring that you're a follower. And here's what it means very simply, that I'm going to say no to me, and I'm going to say yes to Jesus. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to find someone that you love. That Find someone. Everyone find someone. Amy, would you come here? And you're going to tell them out loud in English, all right? Yep. I'm a follower of Jesus. Look them in the eye. I'm a follower of Jesus. Okay. All right. All right. This is a big deal. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Grab a hand of a person near you. Okay, if they just cough like Ryan, you don't have to grab their hand, but everybody else. And I'm going to pray over you, okay? And here's what I want you to do. You're probably by someone that you're somewhat connected with. And as I'm praying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to privately, quietly whisper a prayer for them. Because I will tell you this. Following Jesus is the hardest thing I do. And the person I fight the most to follow is me. Anybody else like that? So we need all the prayer we can get. So let's pray. And as I'm praying, you whisper a prayer for the person you're holding your hand. God, I want to thank you for today. And I'm excited about the future of uh, this decision. This is a huge commitment. Father, as I look, our youth section's empty. So that means Tri-Central and Tipton and Hamilton Heights are going to be different schools this week because these young men and women have committed to following. 
God, it means that families are going to start praying together. God, it means that husband and wife are going to love each other more. God, it means that the children are going to see their mom and dad not just drag them to church, but Father, live Jesus in their home. God, all of us are just like Peter. We're not very good at it, but God, today we declare our allegiance to you. Father, we decide to say no to ourselves and to say yes to Jesus. And God, there's going to be times where it's so hard to do that that we're going to need help from someone. And God, help us to not be too proud to ask for it. I pray this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen.